And just coincidentally, uh, before we get to today's quiz, while people work on the quiz, uh, I should have washed this. And I hate to wash it because I derived this polynomial here. It's a polynomial. Just imagine this thing here, this Greek psi, xi, is an x. Okay? It's not an x because x comes into the coordinate system down here. It has nothing to do with the coordinate system. It's actually what we call the sine of this angle. It's a trigonometric function. But it reduces down to this thing and all these other things. This A is just the radius of this circle. And you come in. And uh, uh, the four is, of course, a four Y cup and X cup are the coordinates of that cup you see over there. Yeah, this cup. Now we have ample evidence that this cup has mysterious properties, that it attracts coin. Okay, because one day I put a penny on that magnet right there and I spun this thing and the penny flew off and landed in the cup. Just spontaneously, I was explaining something to some students and I didn't even notice this. Hey, penny went into a cup. And we're doing analysis in physics. So what happened is this thing was spinning, there's a penny here, and it flew off and went into a cup. We're analyzing this whole thing. Okay. And you know, if you if you've got a future in engineering, it's kind of worth thinking about what that picture means, but it's something that you gotta get some more mathematics to totally understand. Like you gotta have a little bit of trigonometry. But we do have the coordinates of this point and the coordinates of this point. So we get the equation of this line. We get the slope of this line. And the slope of this line uh, is, is just tangent to this angle with the x-axis, okay? Uh, and that has something to do with like this psi, which you can think of as an x, but it's not this x. Now, the point of this is we're about to get into polynomials in here and in free calculus, okay? So the value of the radius of that circle that you see there, and um, things still spinning, it's gonna go on for a while because you've got very low friction, but radius of this circle uh, and the position of the cup determine where the line tangent to the circle is, okay? And all that, comes in to the equation, but this A, this Y cup, this X cup, you see the Y cup a lot of places, and you see an X cup here. Um, those are just numbers. So you got some number in front of X to the fourth, some number in front of X cubed, some number in front of X squared, some number in front of X, and some other number. And you're asking, that should all equal zero if we got the right angle. So we solve this equation for this psi or x and using methods very similar, but somewhat more complicated than the methods we use to solve these quadratic functions that we're studying right now. We're gonna move right into polynomials. So take that as a, an idea that you might wanna store away. And I'm actually gonna probably save that for the calculus class. You hear me say the same thing probably a little quicker if you're in my first alpha. If you aren't, you escape. Okay. Uh, so let's just see where we are. Okay. So the question we have for the quiz was we wanted to graph these two functions. I guess I've got to put this down because I'm not going to make it more for you. Uh, and um, shucks, if I had my talk. I could write something. Okay. So, well, you should recognize from the homework. Okay. And the homework should, if you're in my class, should reinforce everything we've been talking about. This is the toolkit. Quadratic function shifting four units 
to the right. A unit off. Okay. So right away you can just sketch set of coordinate axis. You don't want to mark off a scale until you kind of decide where you want to put this point. Put the point where you want it, and then let the scale follow that. This is my advice. But I want, I know this is going to be a parabola opening upwards. And I know that it's going to be in the first quadrant because the toolkit quadratic, and what we'll even draw, and the toolkit quadratic, here's the line x equals negative two, the line x equals two, and here's the line y equals four. It has a vertex here. And shaped it kind of like this, right? So that it goes through the points negative two, four, and two, four. This is, of course, y equals x squared. Cool kit. Quadratic function. We're going to take this graph and we're going to shift it so that the vertex moves four units to the right and eight units up. Every point moves four units to the right and eight units up. But we want to focus on the vertex because it's kind of the one of the one of the most important points on the graph. So we want to put the vertex. <laughs> Well, okay. You know that another thing we're going to do, if you've done the homework and everybody here has, and did pretty well on it, it's a real well. You know that we're going to have a y-intercept when x equals zero, right? And if x equals zero, you're going to square negative four to get 16, and add that to eight, you're going to get 24, right? So we want the point or the line y equals 24 to appear on our graph. Okay, because we know we're going to go through this point. That x -axis a so we know this is a point on the graph. Now we've got to locate the point for 8. So if y is 24 here, then y is 8, well, about one third of that height. So there's y equals 8. That makes sense. So now we know that the vertex is going to go on this line. It's also going, going to go on the line where x equals four because the y-axis, which is x equals zero, shifts over to x equals four. So we're going to draw a vertical line. Okay. Vertex is going to go somewhere on here. We want the thing to have a shape kind of like this. I'll put x equals four here. And then if I shift the line x equals two to the right and the line x equals negative two and x equals two, I'm going to get lines here. Uh, but actually, I guess I, I kind of don't want to do those lines. So that's going to make it more complicated. The point is, okay, now I've got a graph. It's going to have the same shape as the other one. Now the scale's a little different. And I screwed that up because I was trying to dodge my labeling here, which I should have done a little more carefully. I should have put it a little further to the right. Of course, I didn't have that far to go. But anyhow, it's going to look something like this, but it's going to be a lot more symmetric than what I drew right. So you're not going to be able to use this to do a good estimate of where we cross the line y equals 24. Here, yeah, because but we know what that point is. Okay, so we're not going to be able to use this to make good estimates. We have to make it much more symmetric and you know, whatever you need to do that. Also, this isn't to the same scale. This is, I mean, this is four units here, but this is 16 units here from 8 to 24, right? So we don't have the same scale, but we still see that this vertex shifts 
over eight, over four units and up eight units. It'd be like here on the scale of this graph. The thing would be like this. Um, okay, so really now what I expected to see if you've done the homework, and you might have done it without even thinking about the toolkit function, okay, and the construction of the toolkit shape. Um, you still know what this looks like, and you know it's going to shift over here, so you want to be aware of that. All right. But what you probably did was say, okay, there's the vertex form, the vertex is 4 8, so there it is. Now, if you had marked off a scale from negative 10 to 10, which a lot of people do, and then negative 10 to 10 up here, you would never have gotten this point, would you? Okay. So my recommendation is don't do that. Do what I've done here or something similar. So you leave yourself room to get the picture. And now we have the scale of the graph. There's 24. You know, that's 24 on the y-axis. That's 4 on the x-axis. Um, and, and we have a perfectly good graph if we just keep the scale in mind. Okay. Who kits? The tool kit. Okay, there we go. Now, this one, well, we're going to shift three units to the left and five units down, right? So, the first thing we know is we're going to have a vertex at negative three, five. Correct. The toolkit quadratic function not factor two. And we stretch it vertically. Okay. So you got to be aware they have to vertically stretch this thing by factor two. So your toolkit function is again here, okay? I don't have to draw it again, so I'm just gonna stretch it down here and use it up here, okay? Now I took it the way it was here, so when I stretch it, I better use a different color and I'm running out of additional color. I've got some over here. Okay, so how do we stretch it by a factor of two? Well, we move every point twice as high twice as far from the x-axis, because when we stretch by factor two, we always double the y, we just double the y coordinates. Now, if you want to do coordinates, that means instead of the point two, four, we're going to have to extend this x equals negative two line up there, and the y, x equals two line also, and we're going to have to move this point, which has y coordinate four, there's four units, we might have to double that to eight units, so we just go up to here, over here, we do the same thing. We have the same vertex because when we double the y coordinate, which is zero, we still get zero. So we want to be aware of all that. So we get, I'll just do it kind of with a dotted line down here. We get a shape that looks just like the other one, but it's vertically stretched. And now we got the point negative two, eight, and two, eight. And this function then is y equals two x squared. Okay. We take the 2x squared function and we move its vertex over to negative 3, 5. The other thing is, what's the y-intercept? The y-intercept occurs when x equals 0. If x equals 0, we get 9 minus 5. That's 4. Okay. Okay, so we now... Y-intercept is zero point. Y-intercept occurs on the y-axis, so the x-coordinate is zero. So we replace x by zero and calculate what we get, and I screwed it up. It's 13. As I take a look at the two. Okay? 
Yeah, we're going to square three to get nine. Then we have to multiply by two before we subtract five. So it's a zero thirteen. All right. So we can do a graph. Most of the graphs are going to be in the second and third quadrants. Most of what we're going to plot. Most of the interesting stuff happens uh, to the left of the y-axis or at the y-axis. And the y-intercept is 0, 13. So we're going to have to have 13 on the y-axis. And we're going to have to have five on the x-axis. Uh, well, negative three, five on the y-axis. Okay, so we've got 13 up here. And then we're going to need y equals five, which might be about here. And you can be more meticulous. If we double that, we get 10. Then we got three more. Maybe should have made it just a little bit lower, but this will serve to give us a picture. Um, and then we have to have x equals negative three. Okay. Now, first of all, we know the y intercept, that's here. Okay. Then we have x equals negative three, which we can put anywhere we want. It might be reasonable here. So here's our vertex. Now all we have to do is draw a picture of this shape. And it's gonna to have to go from here through here. I have to go here, so I think it's going to look something like this. And I never can get it symmetric because I'm always looking at the board with an angle. I'm going to stay out of the way. I need to figure out a way to compensate for that. Maybe I can get kind of an AI brain transplant. It causes me to compensate for this. Uh, I'm going to write the functions to compensate. That probably wouldn't be all that helpful, though. Okay, the interesting. Okay, so there we have it. Does that make sense? So this is y equals two times x plus three quantity squared minus five. Okay. Any questions? Comments? I do anything wrong? You might have. I know that this disagrees with one of the graphs that I saw. Um, and I think maybe what I'm seeing on some of the papers, let me take a quick look. Uh, is I screwed up. Okay. Vertex is at negative three, negative five. Right. So when I change the sign of this three, my feeble brain also change the sign of the minus five, which you don't do, obviously, because this is your horizontal shift. So we have to change our graph. Now, I don't want to have to redraw the graph, so I'm just going to redraw my x-axis. Okay. Uh, so if this is 13 and this is y equals negative five, that means the x-axis has to go about here. There's my x-axis. And now uh, I need to, uh, have not watched any boards yet. I have to use the that's so. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of obliterate it's part of the x-axis. Try the board there and there. And now you can't even tell that I messed up. So anybody who wants to prove it's going to have to go to the video. Uh, okay, do you understand what I've got? The vertex is at negative three, negative five. There it is. Now we can estimate the zeros. Okay. 
And then we can solve this equation for the zeros. It's easy to solve. So let me demonstrate that because you're going to need it. Not for the homework you have to do in this course tomorrow or whenever it's due. Um, and probably tomorrow. Uh, zeros are here and here. So what are the coordinates of the zeros? Well, if this is negative three, that looks like it's probably about negative one. Question mark on that, but maybe that's on the line x equals negative one. And that's two units to the right of the axis of symmetry. So that we go two units to the left of negative three, we get x equals negative five. Question mark on that too. Make sense? Just these are our estimates. Just based on this hand drawn graph, I have no idea if they're going to work, but we seem to have integers here, so I'm fairly optimistic that maybe it'll work. I'm not going to bet anything on it. Okay, well, let's just plug it in. If we plug in negative one here, what do we get? Negative one plus three is two. Square two, you get four. Two and two times four is eight, and eight minus five isn't zero. Okay. So now, and this is going to work exactly the same because of the symmetry. We get negative two here, negative five plus three is negative two. We square that, we get four, we double it, we get eight. We subtract five, we get three instead of zero. So we could have looked out and gotten a solution from the graph. The graph shows us what's going on. Now, what we can do is we can pretty easily solve this, okay? The x intercept occurs when y equals zero. If y equals zero, we get zero equals two times the quantity x plus three squared minus five. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to see if you can solve that equation. Okay, that was pretty good, pretty good. Okay, so we have this equation. Now I'm gonna write it with the X on the left. Okay. Now what's the obvious thing you would do? You try to isolate X. You could divide both sides by two. We get closer, get you closer to the X, then you'd have the fraction add to both sides. So as usual, recommend you do additions and subtractions first unless you've got a good reason to do otherwise. So we just add the five to both sides and we get two times x plus three five x squared equals five. Now what else is in our way? Well some people want to try to subtract three to both sides, but you can't Get rid of that three by subtracting three because that three is in an expression that's squared with another derivative. You, you, you can't you can't do that. And uh, but by this stage, I don't think anybody here would attempt to attempt to do that. But not, some people uh, would maybe make that mistake. Okay. So what we want to do is now divide by five. But Two. Don't make mistakes. Okay. And the two will divide this two and leave us x plus three squared equals five halves. Okay. Now, what's the solution? What do we do next? We take the square root of both sides. Okay. 
If x plus three squared equals five halves, then x plus three could be five square root of five halves and the negative square root of five halves. Okay. Now, you all have good algebra skills, obviously. Okay. So you don't necessarily need to write out all the steps I do here, but if you're in doubt, write them out. Okay. Uh, and I think most people did. Okay, so we have X. Now, are we done? Have we, we solved for X? No, not quite. We have to get rid of that three, but now we can. We can do this and we get X equals. Now I'm gonna change the order of the negative three and the plus or minus five halves. That doesn't hurt anything. It's negative three plus or minus the square root of five half. Okay. Now, just to connect this and give you some other aspects of this thing, since we have it here, it's worth taking a few minutes to do this. Okay, well. We can expand this and use the quadratic formula. Now, we first observe that x plus 3 squared equals x plus 3 times x plus 3. And that equals x times x plus 3 plus 3 times x plus 3. In other words, we're just using the distributive law. X plus three times something is X times that something plus three times that something, right? We need to multiply an X by all this, then we multiply three by all this and add it all up. And if you're uncomfortable with that, please somehow let me know. We can spend a little more time uh, talking about the distributive law. Then if we do x times x plus 3, x times x is x squared. x times 3, we're going to write as 3x. Okay? And then 3 times x is, is another 3x. Match up with this one. And 3 times 3 is 9. And we get x squared plus 6x plus 9. That's another thing you want to lock in. You need to understand how to use the distributive law because the pre-calculus class is coming up on factoring, expanding, and using distributive law and so forth. That's all distributive law. Uh, the, the, the stuff you're going to have for homework is basically all distributive law. And we're going to go over that, but this will help get us warmed up. Okay? So, 2 times x plus 3 squared minus 5 equals 0. Becomes 2 times the quantity x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus 5 equals 0. Or 2x squared, and we're distributing 2 times x squared, 2 times 6x, 2 times 9. Then we get 2x squared plus 12x plus 18 minus 5 equals 0. And we then do the 18 minus 5. We get 2x squared plus 12x plus 13 equals 0. Now let's note something. We've seen 13 before. Where we've seen 13 it was the y intersection. Now, this is one way to kind of check that we've at least done something right, because this is exactly the same as this. It just looks different. It's a different form. If we let, if we want to find the y-intercept for this function, where is it? Well, the y-intercept occurs when x equals zero. If you let x equals zero, this is zero, and this is zero, you get 13. So you can see the y-intercept here. Even easier, and you can see it over here. Okay, 
And what you can't see here is the vertical and horizontal shifts and the vertical stretch. Now you can see the vertical stretch, though. So let's just kind of emphasize those two things. Okay. Um, now, I use a little stretch. The Y is 13 here. I don't know why I can't make it talk. It doesn't have little pieces of grid in it. But anyhow, Y equals 13. That's the Y intercept. There it is, right? And then the two in front of X squared. Well, when you square X plus three, you're going to get an X squared, and it's going to get multiplied by that two right here. Okay. So it's going to be the same two. And that's your vertical stretch. So here's the Y intercept. Okay. Now, what we tried to do over here was estimate the zeros. Zeros are a big deal for polynomials, for quadratic functions. Okay. Sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't. Like this function here has no zeros at all because the graph starts above the x axis and opens up. If we had a negative number in front of this, okay, uh, then we'd be reflecting about the x-axis, as I hope you remember, and the graph would be opening downward with this vertex, and we'd have zeros, as the graph would then pass through the x-axis. Well, okay, we solved an equation here to get the zeros, we can solve this equation to get the zeros. Okay. We have two zeros, one for the plus, one for the minus. It's negative b plus or minus this discriminant of the square root of this discriminant over 2a. Okay. Now, negative b over 2a, if you remember what we've done in my pre-calculus class, I don't know that we've done it here, is uh, negative b over 2a is going to give you the axis of symmetry. And where's the axis of symmetry? It's right here. Okay, why is it right here? It's because the zeros occur this distance to the right and this distance to the left of the axis of symmetry. So here's your negative three plus the square root of five halves, and here's your negative three minus the square root of five halves. Well, the quadratic formula should show us the same thing. We plug the numbers into the quadratic formula, we get negative 12. Plus or minus the square root of 12 squared minus 4 times 2 times 13. And right in that really small because I think everybody knows how to plug into the quadratic formula. Okay. It's real easy. Do the homework. I think you've already seen it, but I'm not sure. Okay. Sure. No, man. I didn't know where I was going today until I saw your quizzes, okay? And I pretty much never do. I have all kinds of ideas. And without internet access off campus, I didn't have everything who I'd like to do. Okay, anyhow, that's negative 12. Plus or minus the square root of what? That's 144. That's eight times 13, which is 104. So that's the square root of 40. Well, then it's negative 12 over 4. Plus or minus 
the square root of 40 over 4. Okay. Now, there's more I could say here, but I'm out of board space and I really don't want to digress that far of this comment. There's your negative 3. And the square root of 40 divided by 4 is the square root of 5 halves. Because the square root of 40 is the square root of 4 times 10. The square root of 4 is 2. So it's 2 times the square root of 10. And then they have 1 half that and wrong. It didn't quite seem to work out. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, square root of 40 is about uh, 6.4. Divide that by 4, you get about 1.6. Yeah, you get about 1.6. Square root of 5 halves is a square root of 2.5. 1.6 squared is 2.56. So yeah, that works out. If somebody's doing a medley that, that would put inside the square root, it didn't seem to work. I have to write it out, see where my brain is firing on that. But if I do a decimal approximation, I get 1.6 there, I get a little less than 1.6 here. 1.6 is a little too big for this, but that meant I got that just by next. Okay. Uh, the point is now. What have we done? We've graphed this function. There's the standard procedures that everybody is pretty well on with the homework, right? And then we estimated the zeros to be negative one and negative five. Okay. Actually, the zeros are negative three plus or minus the square root of five halves. Or if you prefer negative 12 fourths plus or minus or quarter over four, well, that equals negative three plus or minus square root of five halves. And take my word for it, there's black magic between here and here that's not hard to understand, but we I'm gonna I'm not gonna mess with that today. Uh open math will work you through it, and yeah. I probably will too. Uh, when it becomes important. Okay, so okay, so we solve this equation, which is pretty easy to solve. We can skip a couple of these steps if our algebra is pretty good and get it in two or three steps or three or four steps. Okay, you just look at this. You have five to both sides. You divide by two. Then x plus three is plus or minus the square root of that. So x is negative three plus or minus the square root of that. That's four steps instead of one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, do the seven steps if you need to. Okay, anyhow, we can expand this into this form, which is totally equivalent, gives you exactly the same value. Okay, and from this form, we can read off the y intercept in the vertical stretch. We can't quite read off the axis symmetry in the vertex. It takes a little more work. We've done that in pre calculus. Uh, you can get the vertex. It's it, x equals negative b over 2a. And right there it is smiling at you inside the quadratic formula. It could even happen. The negative b over 2a becomes your negative 3. Because your negative b over 2a is negative 12 over 2 times 2, which is negative 12 over 4, which separates out in negative 12 over 4, which is negative 3. If you understand all that, you've got a pretty good bundle of concepts and procedures to deal with quadratic functions, okay? All right. Um, okay, we need to uh, give you a little bit of review. There's one more thing that I'd really like to do with this, but I think we need to do something different to help you prepare for your homework. Although I think you'll find this part pretty easy. Um, Okay.
I saw that big ugly polynomial I showed you at the beginning, right? Let's just say that polynomial instead was, and I'll use X instead of the Greek sign, uh, AX cubed minus 4X squared plus 12X. So let's just say that's a polynomial. I'll call that P of X. Instead of F of X, I'll use P for polynomial. <coughs> Is there anything I can factor out of that? Is there a number I could factor? What's the biggest number I could factor out of this? Okay, I asked, is there any number we could factor out of this? And two people held up four fingers and one person kept writing because they probably knew. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, so I wouldn't interrupt your train of thought. Uh, so we can factor four out of this. That means we could write this as four times two x cubed minus x squared plus three x. Okay. And there's no other number we can factor out of it because the x squared is already factored down to just a plus or minus one, okay? Has no number except plus or minus one in front of it. Okay. Now, is there anything else that we, we can factor out of this? Signal with your fingers if you think you see something we can factor. Okay. What I was looking for was this. Okay. We can factor out an X. Every term here contains factor X, right? So we could write this as 4X times 2X squared minus X plus 3. Okay. That makes sense. Now, uh, just want to point out that factoring, just make sure everybody's on, on board with this, because you might not understand the word factor out if it's been a while since you had an algebra course. Okay. It just means is we use a distributive law in reverse. If you look at this and do a little practice with factoring, as you're going to do with the assignment, uh, you're going to see. Uh, that it's the same as this. Once I write this out, you're going to see it because 4 times 2x cubed is 8x cubed. 4 times negative x squared is negative 4x squared. 4 times 3x gives us 12x, right? So we just kind of ask ourselves, what could we do if we use a distributive law backwards? That's one thing. And there's another thing, and we also got an x in common. So every one of these numbers has an x, it has a, a 4 as a factor. And there's no bigger number that would work because or it is one of the numbers here. Okay. We could also though factor out X because everything has an X as a factor. And we could write 4X times this and it's going to work. 4X times 2X squared, 4 times 2 is 8, X times X squared is X cubed, right? Or we could just look at it here. Uh, you know, X times 2X squared gives us 2X cubed. Well, then x times negative x is negative x squared, and so forth. Okay? So that's the idea. We look for the biggest factor that's in common with all these terms. Okay? And that's to be handy. If I ask you to solve p of x equals zero, Now that looks sort of scary because you don't know what to do with an x cubed. Okay. You got a quadratic formula if you got an x squared. Okay. This is a little less scary. A whole lot less scary. Okay. 
because, well, let me tell you why it's less scary. Okay, I'm going to just put a couple of uh, multiplications up here, and I want you to do them. Okay. Okay. Let's try seven thousand three hundred forty-two multiplied by three thousand five hundred ninety-six multiplied by zero multiplied by twelve. What do you got? Show me some figures. Yeah, you got a zero in there. Multiplication, multiply any of the multiply any of the these things by zero, and you're going to get zero. Zero times twelve is zero. Then you got three thousand five hundred ninety-six times zero, which is zero. Then you got this times zero, which is zero, right? If you got one zero in there, you got zero. Okay. Call that the zero property. So multiplication. Okay. If one thing in a product is zero, then when you pair anything up with zero, you're going to get zero. And pair anything that's left with zero, you're going to get zero. It's going to all give you zero. And you just kind of know that. If there's one zero in there, wipes everything out. Okay, so this is less scary. I'm not going to write that way. I'm not going to write out all the words. I'm trying to read your minds, and uh, sometimes I'm better at that than others. Um, This equation is equivalent to this equal to zero. Is this is zero? The whole thing is zero. So if you got a solution of four x equals zero, which is pretty easy to solve, you have one solution. And if you can solve this part equal, if this part is equal to zero, you also get zero. Make sense? Okay. Now, well, this gives you x equals zero. I mean, you divide both sides by four, and you're going to get x equals zero over four, which is zero. And it's obvious that this is going to be zero if and only if x is zero. Or x is one of these solutions. You get two solutions by setting this quadratic equal to zero. Okay. Well, this turns out to be one fourth plus or minus the square root of what? That's one. Four times two times three is uh, twenty-four. So it's one minus 24, which is negative 23. Okay. Has the square root of negative 23 a number you can put on the x-axis? No, it's an imaginary number. Okay. Well, bring all this up here. Thus. Okay. 
for x equals zero or x equals this, and for no other number, because if one of these isn't zero, then you have two numbers that aren't zero, and you can't get zero by multiplying two numbers that aren't zero, okay? If any of the numbers here was not zero, if that zero changed to anything else, we would have a result that you don't want to have to calculate, okay? Now, Okay, this isn't a real number. Got to change my words here. Ain't real numbers. Okay, these ain't real numbers. On account of negative square root of negative 23 ain't a real number. And even though one fourth is, when you add an imaginary number to it, it ain't real no more. <laughs> okay. So that's the only, uh, th th these aren't real numbers. The only zero is x equals zero. So the graph. P of x. As through the x-axis, only at zero zero, only at the order. Now we're not quite to the point where we want to talk about the shape of the graph of this p of x. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of terminology. It's not really required for the homework you have coming up here, uh, but it's going to be important in your pre-calculus class if it isn't already. I'll say it's the completely factored form of p of x equals 8x cubed minus 4x squared plus 12x. Okay. I'll say this is the completely factored form because this term here can't be factored any further. Because if it could, it could give us real zeros. Which it doesn't. Because that discriminant there is negative. Okay. So we have then
And X is a linear function. Graph of 4X would be a straight line, wouldn't it? Graph of Y equals 4X. So this is a linear. Function. And actually, we just consider that four to be the coefficients of y equals x is our linear function here. And it's zero only at zero because y equals x is just a 45 degree line through the origin, right? And this is Irreducible quadratic factor. By irreducible, that means we can't factor it any further. It doesn't give us any zeros. Okay. Since I'm here, I'll take one more minute to state. Fundamental theorem of algebra. Here are polynomial factors into linear. And irreducible quadratic factors. In a pre calculus course, we traditionally spent a lot of time learning how to factor things like this, okay? Because of hurricane disruptions and so forth. In my pre-calculus class, at least, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on those things, but we will spend some time in here. More, as much time in here as we spend in there, probably even a little more, because some people in this course, or many people in this course, especially the distance course, which has access, of course, to the uh, same materials and the um, videos, uh, are very likely to need it because other instructors make their own decisions. It doesn't mean I'm right and they're wrong. It doesn't mean they're right and I'm wrong. If we have different decisions, it's just different ways we think is going to work for our students. Um, and we trust each other on that. Uh, okay, so <laughs> the fools trust me on that. <laughs> Don't let them know that I'm on to them. Uh, okay, so there it is. Uh, that's a big deal. That means whatever polynomial, that big polynomial I showed you at the beginning, it's a fourth degree polynomial, it does factor into linear and irreducible quadratic factors. Okay? And you can identify a lot of that if you can graph it. Or if you can identify those factors, you can graph them. Okay? That's the big deal on polynomials. So I've given you the broad sweep of polynomials here. I don't think you're going to have trouble with the assignment that's due Thursday. Okay, it's just factoring. And it's not even factoring trinomials, it's just factoring stuff out. Okay, like what we saw. Okay, good. <laughs>